Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real History. I am history professor Jared Frederick and we're so glad that you can join us for the 10th and final episode of Band of Brothers, which is entitled Points. It's been a long road to this journey for Easy Company. Uh, we have traced their evolution as a fighting unit from Toccoa, Georgia, all the way to the Alps in Austria. And in this final episode of the acclaimed HBO series Band of Brothers, uh, we, we have a conclusion. We have a finale. And it's a very fitting one at that. And I think what this episode perhaps demonstrates best, that even though these men helped win the war, in the weeks and months that followed, they would also have to win the peace. And so, with all that being said, let's go ahead and dive into the final episode of Band of Brothers. The 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, at this point in the spring of 1945, uh, finds itself in the vicinity of Zellemse, Austria, and these various communities that were neighboring the Alps, and they were incredibly picturesque. They were these resort towns. Hardly anything was damaged. Uh, there were still comparatively uh, plentiful food stores. Uh, that were located here. And as far as the men of Easy Company were concerned, they were living better here in the land of their enemies than what they were in England or even the United States at times. Ran into the regimental photographer. Said he had all these photographs of the 506 going all the way back to Tekoa. That photographer's name was Al Krochka. And indeed, he uh, traded a big bundle of uh, photographs uh, with Winters for a Luger, perhaps multiple Lugers. Um, and so it, it, it speaks to how I, I think some soldiers were prioritizing things. Uh, you know, a lot of GIs wanted German loot, captured items, and uh, Winters certainly did that too, to an extent. Um, but we also see this sentimentality emerging, and it will be that sentimentality for his beloved Easy Company that he carries through his life until his dying days. And we'll reflect on the importance of that more as we get near the end of the episode. We'll see how you do in your interview, but, uh, you know, man of your qualifications, I think, probably scrape something up. Once again, for as different as these two officers were, they had this very uh, tight and compelling camaraderie. Uh, you know, Nixon was this heavy drinking Ivy Leaguer, and Winters was this rather shy country boy from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who hardly ever drank anything. And it, at face value, it seemed like these two men were polar opposites. Um, but something clicked here, and they forged a friendship in battle that likewise would last them the rest of their lives. And we see that sort of friendship uh, being cemented here even further with these conversations and considerations about what these men are going to do after the war. And the war wasn't even over. I was still getting used to hot showers and morning swims. This routine of Winters was very much part of his persona. This was a guy who would get up early to exercise, to run. He would get these strange looks from the Germans <laughs> uh, as he was doing so. Um, this was a time when uh, physical standards were being lowered just ever so slightly um, because there was a realization that the war was coming to an end, uh, but winners continued to do push-ups, pull-ups, run several miles perhaps every day, go swimming on occasion. This was one fit dude. He was built like a house. When are we expecting the engineers to arrive? These various impediments like we see here with the roadblocks were very much a real detriment uh, to the men of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Um, the Germans were blowing up bridges. These bridges would sometimes go across these very steep ravines. Uh, engineers would come under fire. Uh, support would come in and the GIs would have to 
trek down one side of the ravine, up the other, and fight all along the way. And indeed, um, these paratroopers recognized that these were some of the most hardcore elements of the Third Reich that they were confronting. In some cases, perhaps SS troops or men of the Gestapo who refused to give up, who wanted to fight to the very end. And this was the sort of uh, scattered yet determined resistance that Easy Company, as well as units on their flanks, were encountering as they were moving here ever and ever closer to the fabled German community of Berchtesgaden. Now you fire up 2nd Battalion and outflank that French son of a bitch. Yes, sir. <laughs> on May 3rd, 1945, Easy Company uh, gathered weapons, ammunition, and supplies. And uh, they, in addition to a lot of other Allied units, um, embarked on this mad dash down the Audubon. Uh, toward Berchtesgaden because all these different Allied units wanted to get to the symbolic home of Nazi Germany first. And there were roadblocks, bottlenecks, these detours that they had to take. And as one lieutenant said, there were simply too many people on the road that day. And it would not be until May 5th, 1945, and actually we're filming this on May 5th, interestingly enough, the anniversary of this, fitting. Uh, but it was on that day uh, that the 101st Airborne Division, as well as other units, arrived in this community. Contrary to what Stephen Ambrose's book indicates and what this series claims, uh, the 101st Airborne Division was not the first Allied unit to reach Berchtesgaden. Uh, that distinction uh, actually goes to the 7th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division. And um, this is something that General Maxwell Taylor, commander of the 101st Airborne Division, himself recognized and admitted in post-war interviews. Um, and, you know, indeed, there were French troops, uh, French armored troops that were descending on the community as well. And so um, they were, all these units were very much neck and neck. And uh, you had paratroopers intermingling with uh, foot soldiers and uh, French engineers and French armored troops. And uh, they all arrived very, very closely to the same time. Uh, but as far as the official army record is concerned, the 3rd Infantry Division and not the 101st Airborne got there first. A nice detail here, we can see uh, these troops arriving at the Birches Godner Hof Hotel. And uh, as we can see in these scenes, uh, indeed, uh, Winters and Lieutenant Welsh uh, wandered in here. Uh, they started uh, seeking out uh, souvenirs, uh, silverware and whatnot. And uh, you know, they could very much get a sense uh, that, that they had just arrived here as uh, Germans were fleeing these buildings, fleeing the community. And uh, these, these scenes here are just uh, wonderfully uh, recreated showing that moment. Kitty would love this. How many brides get a wedding present from Hitler? There was so much silverware in China and uh, eating utensils and such that were floating around the 101st Airborne Division in, in the days and weeks after this. Th these were highly coveted souvenirs and indeed in some cases uh, uh, the silverware even had the swastika etched in it uh, for uh, some troops who really lucked out in their souvenir abilities. Uh, they even found silverware with A.H. for Adolf Hitler uh, inscribed on it as well. Uh, and so indeed these were trophies of war and even uh, strict disciplinarians like Dick Winters uh, absolutely had no problem with his men seizing these items as such. As far as he was concerned, they had earned it. Uh, the, the plunder of war. Built with Nazi party money. A mountaintop stone retreat 
8,000 feet up, accessible by a gold-plated elevator. When some of the paratroopers arrived at the foot of the Obersalzburg, uh, where Hitler's Kelstein House, also known as the Eagle's Nest, was located, they found some French engineers there who were trying to blow open or break open the steel-plated elevator doors that would take you to the top. Uh, but as far as these French engineers were concerned, that it was going to take some finagling in order to get these doors open. Um, and so it was at that moment that men of Easy Company and possibly other companies uh, started uh, trekking the 400 rocky feet to the very top. This is a very accurate recreation of the interior of the Eagle's Nest. And interestingly enough, uh, the Eagle's Nest was only used by Hitler on a handful of occasions. And there are a number of different stories or rationales as to why he used it so infrequently. Um, one of the stories is that Hitler was actually somewhat fearful of heights or the altitude possibly uh, made him feel ill. Uh, even though he did not use it on a highly regular basis, this was a very symbolic place. Uh, these men had reached the mountaintop, both literally and figuratively. And uh, it's almost like a storybook ending that this is the place where they would end the Second World War. From Corps, just came in, effective immediately. All troops stand fast on present positions. You ready for it? Listen up. German army surrendered. VE Day, also known as Victory in Europe Day, uh, took place on May 8th, uh, 1945. And it was around this time, as we can see in this scene, uh, that uh, these troopers came across uh, the bombed out wreckage of Luftwaffe leader Hermann Goering's household. And uh, not too far away, there was a large cache of liquor some of the finest to be found in Europe. Uh, Winters uh, said in his memoirs that he initially came across this and he, he went down these dark, deep stone steps and he, he found this huge vault that he estimated had 100,000 bottles of liquor, champagne, wine, everything imaginable. And uh, he went off to run some additional errands, but he eventually brings Lewis Nixon, this connoisseur of liquor, as we've seen in uh, various other episodes. And indeed, as we can see here, he brings him here and says, take what you want, give out the rest among other companies within the regiment. And indeed, this was an order that Nixon was happy to fulfill. Happy VE Day. And uh, Lewis Nixon was certainly not the only one to partake. Indeed, many men within the regiment uh, partook of these uh, luxuries that had been recently found. And as uh, David Webster later recounted, uh, he said, I could hardly stand. You know, he was in formation one morning. Uh, Captain Spears was standing right in front of him. And uh, he was so liquored up that he felt like he was going to do a face plant right in front of his captain. Um, and so, you know, there's indeed room for a little bit of levity here in the wake of Nazi Germany's surrender. There, there's a lot of comical anecdotes uh, stemming from uh, these impromptu celebrations on VE Day. Several of them include uh, the shenanigans of uh, Gordon Carson and Captain Spears. Uh, in one instance, uh, Spears had been driving around uh, Hermann Goering's uh, luxury Mercedes, and uh, Colonel Strayer uh, comes up to him and essentially says, hand over the keys, and uh, Spears says, no, not yet, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and he, he drives off the Mercedes, leaving uh, Colonel Strayer in the dust, and so uh, Spears drove back to a, a camp or an assembly area, got out an M1 Grand and uh, shot the Mercedes full of holes and then pushed it over the side of a cliff. And I suppose he was of the mind that if I can't have it, nobody can have it. Another episode uh, involved uh, Spears and Carson uh, participating in this 
uh, kind of sharpshooting contest. They were throwing champagne and whiskey bottles off of a balcony and trying to shoot at the midair. Uh, and in the process, uh, Spears forgot the own orders that he issued to not become involved in any necess un unnecessary gunfire or gunplay. Uh, and so uh, Floyd Talbert runs into the scene with his hand on his holster, ready to confront the perpetrator. And he was very surprised indeed to find out that it was none other than his captain who issued this order, <laughs> who was involved in this transgression. Prior to this moment, uh, there had been widespread concerns that uh, the Germans were going to uh, dig into the mountains and that they were going to fight a guerrilla war that might have gone on for uh, months or, or years longer. And uh, fortunately for these Allied troops, that turned out not to be the case. The war is over! Not all of these encounters with German civilians uh, were as uh, warm or cozy as this. Uh, among the really interesting prisoners that the 101st Airborne captured was a woman by the name of Paula Wolf Hitler, who turned out to be the Fuhrer's sister. Uh, and she was detained, she was put under house arrest, um, but ultimately it was determined that simply being the sister of this guy was uh, not reason in and of itself to hold her, and uh, eventually she was released. Please accept this as my formal surrender, Major. It is better than to lay it on the desk of a clerk. You may keep your sidearm, Colonel. This is not actually how this encounter went down. Uh, you know, in the series, it's shown as, you know, Winner's letting this officer keep his sidearm as an act of, of chivalry, uh, as a, a tip of the hat from officer to officer. Um, in reality, though, uh, Winner's did accept this sidearm. And uh, later on, when he examined this pistol, uh, he had found that it had never been fired, that it was still in factory condition, that this German officer who had gone through the war, uh, Winters found out that uh, he even faced off with the 101st Airborne at Bastogne, and he went through the whole war without firing this pistol. And um, if you happen to watch the supplemental documentary that goes along with the series entitled We Stand Alone Together, uh, Winters talks about this a little bit more in depth. And, you know, he, 60 years later, Winters still had this firearm. And he said that, you know, he never once fired it, uh, that it, it would always be unfired. And he admitted, you know, this is how all wars should end, that nobody should have blood on their hands, so to speak, uh, when peace is finally reached. And so it's, it was a, a somewhat poetic moment in Winters' mind. Um, and perhaps the show missed an opportunity here uh, to uh, explore some of that nuance and complexity a little bit more in depth. This was not the only pistol uh, that, that Winters uh, garnered uh, in these uh, days in Austria and Germany. Um, in fact, he mailed home uh, two dozen weapons uh, to his family uh, back in Lancaster. He had the ability and the flexibility to do this because as the battalion commander, he oversaw the mail, <laughs> by and large. Um, and so, uh, you know, he, he later on got some photos of, of him taking them out to the range and uh, firing them uh, while they were occupying uh, Austria and Germany. Um, and so, uh, it just goes to show that, you know, winners too uh, got his share of souvenirs uh, before he headed back home. Dead of a combined army and marine force marked the grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war... The Battle of Okinawa, which was taking place on the other side of the world simultaneous with all of this, would be one of the, the largest and bloodiest battles in the Pacific, uh, where not only you had large numbers of U.S. and Japanese troops being claimed, but Okinawa also had a fairly substantial civilian population uh, that sadly became collateral damage amidst all of this carnage as well. Um, and certainly, 
Men in the 101st Airborne Division were well aware of this war that was taking place out in the Pacific, and there was a strong likelihood that they themselves would end up fighting in that conflict as well. We're gonna tell the men right away? Some of them will have enough points to go home instead. Not many. It's their only medal's Purple Heart. The point system that is addressed here uh, was uh, this, this sometimes complicated arithmetic that could determine whether or not a serviceman or woman could go home. And the points that you needed often depended upon the type of unit you were in, what your rank was, um, and I'm sure it was very complicated for uh, troops who were over in Europe at the time and, and trying to figure it out themselves. But uh, roughly speaking, how it went is that for every month in the service, you received a point. If you were overseas for each one of those months on top of that, you would receive an additional point. If you received a combat award, uh, such as a Purple Heart or a Bronze Star, you would have five points added on uh, for each additional one of those that you had. Uh, and if you were married or had children or dependents, uh, you got a whopping 12 additional points uh, going on top of that. I mean, certainly, so all of these numbers were running through the minds of the men in Easy Company and other units uh, scattered throughout Europe. Um, but given the high rate of replacements uh, that a lot of American units had at this given moment, uh, as Winters just indicated, not many men could afford such a luxury to go home early ahead of everybody else. How about y'all just shut up? Let shift to kill us some dinner. Ah, uh, what's the matter, bull? You tired of eating dried up spuds three times a day? In some of these regions, um, after Americans had been there for several weeks or months, uh, food shortages quickly developed. And Captain Spears actually sent uh, squads or platoons on occasion uh, to go up into the mountains, to go up into these surrounding woodlots uh, to hunt for deer uh, in order so the, the ranks could have venison. And uh, David Webster uh, was uh, one such individual who wrote about this. Uh, but Webster admitted, you know, that uh, Spears only picked the best marksmen and the best soldiers and Webster was neither. <laughs> and so he never got to go on one of these little hunting forays out into the woods. Oh, God damn it, Shifty. In another instance, uh, later on, by the time we get to the summer of 1945, uh, Dick Winters hired a local mountain guide to take him up in the mountains uh, to go uh, stalking for goat. Uh, he, he really wanted to bag a mountain goat and purportedly get its, its horns as a souvenir. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, Winters would sometimes uh, ski with this guy, he would ski with his men uh, as well. And uh, interestingly and almost tragically enough, uh, Winters slipped down a ledge as he was hunting this goat. And he nearly fell off the side of a cliff. Uh, and he took a, a really hard plow into the, the earth as he was doing so. And he actually chipped one of his front teeth. Um, and so uh, part of uh, Winters was partially toothless um, during this time in, in occupation. Uh, but that did not deter him uh, because uh, he did indeed bag the goat that he was hunting. And today, at the Hershey Dairy Township Historical Society in Hershey, Pennsylvania, you can see the horns of the goat that Winters hunted in 1945 when he almost lost his life. And indeed, Winters was pleased not to have lost his life at the hands of an Austrian mountain goat. One man home in each company, Effective immediately. For easy company, the winner is... In order to reward men who had really excellent records, uh, Colonel Sink devised a lottery system uh, that would, and, and a number of men were actually rewarded amidst this lottery system. 
there couldn't have been any infractions on your record. Your record had to be spotless. Um, often men with combat records were, were favored amidst all of this. And not only were men like Daryl Shifty Powers rewarded amidst all of this, um, but so were the likes of uh, troopers like Forrest Guth, um, who if they were not sent home on a permanent basis, they at least got something like a 30-day leave. Sergeant Daryl C. Powers! Yeah. That's how it's done, Shifty! Powers was one of these really uh, beloved uh, non-coms in Easy Company. He had this easy-going uh, Virginia gentleman demeanor uh, that just made him really approachable and really accessible to his men. Uh, but they knew that they could not be fully deceived uh, by that warm personality because uh, this guy was one heck of a marksman. Uh, and indeed, he uh, took out a number of Germans uh, amidst his trials by fire. I just don't rightly know how I'm going to explain all this. You see, I... I... This is such a revealing scene uh, because, uh, you know, already these, these veterans, they're wondering how they're going to readjust. How are they going to tell their family members about what they've gone through? Will they be able to get along with their neighbors or childhood friends who did not serve in the war? Um, these were things of, uh, of great weight uh, that, that bore down on the shoulders of these veterans. And a movie that we will definitely be examining later on in our series that uh, looks at this issue of readjustment in a, a very dramatic way is The Best Years of Our Lives. If you've never seen that movie, check it out. We're going to revisit that at a later point. Two days later, Shifty Powers was on a truck headed for the rear in a boat home. Unfortunately, the truck was hit head-on by a drunken corporal from another regiment. Shifty Powers did survive... Uh, the, the automobile wreck uh, that he was in. He was uh, laid up in hospital for several months, but he, he lived a very long life. He became one of the talking heads for uh, this series, and he lived until the year 2009. She's waited for you for three years, right? We'll be to Tokyo and back in two years, three tops. Probably be over before you even get there. I love moments like this in the series um, because um, there was this... This, this quad of, of officers, uh, Winters, Welsh, Nixon, and Spears, who became really tight during these days in Austria. And uh, as, as Winters often wrote home to his uh, pen pal back in the States, Dieta Allman, uh, the level that these three other guys would, would often drink uh, as they were uh, reflecting upon their, their war stories was something that uh, greatly amused Winters. And, uh, you know, it, he said, uh, you know, oh boy, like they're mixing, you know, rum and vermouth and vodka. <laughs> he said it won't be long now. Um, and so, you know, he, he, he loved these guys, you know, truly, like brothers. And uh, that love comes out in a lot of the letters that he was writing home. So you were given command of the company on D-Day. That's right. The Major General who we see uh, winners conversing here with in this headquarters setting uh, was a gentleman by the name of Elbridge Chapman, uh, who was uh, set to become the commanding officer of the 13th Airborne Division, which was believed would be deployed to the Pacific uh, at one point. And uh, Winters wrote about this conversation uh, in uh, one of his letters to his pen pal. And uh, this letter, among many others, is uh, featured in my book, Hang Tough, which looks at uh, Winters' correspondence and wartime artifacts. And uh, Winners uh, wrote to Dieta Allman from Caprun, Austria on May 26th, 1945. Say, by the way, this morning I had an interview with Major General Chapman, CO of the 13th Airborne Division. I wanted to transfer. I figured they were hot and going to the South Pacific straight and quick. However, it looks like everybody goes through the States first. So that means I just can't cut any corners on that count. Stuck. Damn it. 
He did say he'd be glad to have me if his outfit left and the 101st Airborne was scheduled to say, stay in the States. So, there I am, no further ahead than before, but a bit wiser for my trouble. Winters' desire to go to the uh, Pacific, I think, is one of the most revealing things about his character. Uh, this was not a guy who was doing it for ego. Uh, he was not a, a hawkish sort of person. He had learned to hate war. Uh, certainly, he had seen enough of it. But he writes in his letters that if I can go to the Pacific, and if I can lead these, these green enlisted men into combat, perhaps I can save some of their lives. And he says, you know, they have mothers just like I do. I'm no more special than they are. Their mothers love them, uh, just as mine loves me. And he said in his correspondence that, you know, I have it, and they don't. Not yet. And so, you know, there was this firm conviction in his mind that he needed to go where he could best be used. And he ostensibly could have gotten this easy ticket taken him back home to Pennsylvania, but that is not the route he wanted to go because he had this sublime sense of duty and conviction. And what else do you need to know about Dick Winters? I think in so many ways that really gets to the heart of who he was. These flashbacks are important because it was flashbacks like this that actually played out in Winters' mind in the years following the war. He, he writes at one point in, in his memoirs that you know, he, was, he was walking down his, his street in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and a kid ran a stick along a picket fence, and the, the quick staccato sound of that in Winters' mind, it, it remotely sounded like, like a machine gun. And he, he took a dive into the gutter, taking cover for a machine gun that wasn't there. And so indeed, these, these scenes uh, most certainly played out in his mind, even long afterward. Frank, I think you men have earned the right to keep you around. General Chapman here is played by this wonderful character actor by the name of David Andrews. And um, he played Pete Conrad in Apollo 13. Uh, and he also played astronaut Frank Borman in uh, the Tom Hanks miniseries From the Earth to the Moon, uh, which is like Band of Brothers in Space, uh, and became a foundation for these prestige miniseries uh, like Band of Brothers. Um, and so um, he's in a lot of Tom Hanks productions and he makes a really nice cameo here in the final episode of this series. So I would stay in Austria for the time being, waiting for orders and trying to watch over soldiers who had no enemy to fight. Winters later would become uh, a major in the New Jersey National Guard and was almost shipped off to Korea. Um, but he got a, a last-minute reprieve uh, from doing so, and he ultimately opted not to go to Korea um, because, as he, his character admits at the end of the series, he had seen enough of war. It's in the fucking room, Webb. One of those Polacks where was at the slave camps that this is where the guy lives right here. Which camp? Whatever camp. These paratroopers were, in fact, under orders from Captain Spears to get a hold of this German officer who was living nearby, uh, who purportedly was involved in one of these uh, labor camps. Um, but in the, the book, A Band of Brothers, um, the, the, the characters who are involved are a little bit different. Uh, this uh, mission, so to speak, uh, was headed by Sergeant Don Lynch, uh, and also included was uh, Dawn Moon, and also, as we see here in this scene, uh, Sisk behind the wheel and Liebgott. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Webster was, was not involved in all of this, and he kind of uh, fills in the place for uh, Dawn Moon, 
who, to my knowledge, is, is not uh, featured with any prominence uh, in the series. And, uh, you know, uh, by and large, uh, this, this execution uh, plays out uh, largely as it happened, as far as, as Moon could remember. Uh, these paratroopers uh, drove this officer down the road. Uh, they told him to face the road. And Don Moon refused to participate. And he said, the war's over. Uh, kill him yourself. And at that moment, that's exactly what Sisk and Liebgott did. She's in the commandant. She's in the commandant. Much like Captain Sobel, the religious faith of Liebgott is something that is contested. Um, some people claim that they were Jewish. Uh, others claim that they were Catholics. But certainly making Liebgott a Jew in these sorts of episodes uh, adds a certain edge to the narrative as he is trying to seek his own level of vengeance for the Holocaust that he witnessed. Franz! Franz off the bed. Really? Yeah. Five years. I think I was in every country. Scenes like this with Janovic offer some interesting insight on the origins of post-war Germany where there are these efforts to establish uh, civil government, uh, you know, put law enforcement, postmasters, uh, people of that manner and that caliber uh, back in these somewhat mild positions of power to get Germany kind of back on its feet. Um, this uh, crossroads checkpoint scene is also notable because it underscores just how many millions of people were displaced as a result of Allied bombing. Uh, combat ravaging their various communities, people setting out to start new lives or uh, look for missing family members. Uh, it was uh, one heck of a humanitarian crisis uh, and, and certainly these allied occupiers were, were witness to a, a lot of that swaying back and forth. <laughs> In some of these scenes, we can get a sense of the varied interactions that these Americans had with the Germans and Austrians. And uh, the best observer uh, to all of this was uh, David Webster himself. Um, and I think one of the, the really uh, undervalued books in the, the large canon of Band of Brothers books um, is his uh, memoir, which is entitled Parachute Infantry. And he has this to say about uh, some of the, the interactions uh, with the Germans. And uh, he was in a conversation with uh, one of his lieutenants. Uh, some companies let the crowds live in the basement, the lieutenant noted as we entered the next house and started up the stairs. They keep them around to cook and wash the dishes and sweep the floors and do the laundry. But Captain Spears doesn't believe in that, and neither do I. Krauts only get in your hair if you'll let them stay in their own houses. I say move them the hell out. The bastards moved everybody else out of Europe, made them slave laborers, put them in concentration camps. You have to be hard on these people. Uh, and indeed, uh, Webster uh, witnessed more than one occasion of that sort of retribution being inflicted. 75 points. What? He was 10 points short. Webster describes the death of Janovic much like we see here in this scene. And uh, John Janovic is, is really one of those kind of uh, mystery men of easy company. You know, he, he didn't survive the war. Uh, you know, he didn't write any post-war reminiscences or anything like that, and he's, he's somewhat of a, a footnote during this time of occupation. Uh, Janovic was from the Chicago area, and like so many uh, fatalities of Easy Company, he was temporarily buried in uh, an overseas national cemetery. And when World War II came to an end, 
uh, there was this huge repatriation process for the, the American dead. And American families essentially had three options. They could let their loved ones be buried overseas. The remains could be taken home uh, and put in you know, a family plot or a hometown cemetery. Or you could have the remains reburied in a national cemetery that was domestically located. And so uh, for people like the Janoviks, uh, those were the three options that they had available. And ultimately, uh, the Janoviks opted to have their son brought home and he was uh, reburied uh, in the United States in 1949. Well, I guess I'll just use his jiba. I don't think he's going to be needing it. Hold on a second now, right? All right, I'm going to pause this because there is a lot to unpack with the shooting of Sergeant Chuck Grant. This incident took place on May 27th, 1945, just about three weeks after VE Day. And what we see here in the series is an incredibly condensed version of the events that transpired that fateful night. There were two paratroopers in the 101st Airborne. Uh, one was named Floyd Craver, and the other was named Dewey Hogue. These two men were stationed in the community of Saufelden, Austria, uh, which was a, a, a huge um, station area for the 101st Airborne at this time. Um, these two paratroopers had hit the town, they had shared a bottle of cognac, uh, Craver was high on marijuana cigarettes, and they decided after a little bit of a break that they were going to go back out and hit the town a little bit more. They hire essentially a taxi to take them out and about, and it is while they are going down uh, presumably this, this country road that the car breaks down. And so you have these two drunken paratroopers standing by the side of the road wondering what they are going to do next. They then see headlights coming down the road. They stop the vehicle. The man driving that vehicle was a surrendered German officer by the name of Edward Altiker. Altiker had served on the Eastern Front, he had fought against the Russians, and he was now essentially on his way home. A white armband was uh, around his sleeve, and going by the dictates and the terms of surrender, as an officer he was allowed to keep his sidearm as such. Craver, having stopped the vehicle, tries to reach inside the car to seize Altiker's sidearm. Altiker starts driving off, uh, but Craver still has his own pistol. He raises that pistol, shoots a number of rounds into the car, Altiker is killed. The car goes into a nearby ditch. It is at that moment that Hogue hightails it out of there because he doesn't want to have anything to do with all of this. In short, what happens after a number of other meanderings is that Craver encounters a British major who is coming down the road in a jeep with one of his warrant officers. That major was a gentleman by the name of R.G. Watkin. And Craver convinces Watkin that he needs help with his vehicle. And so Watkin, being the good ally that he was, tries to help Craver get his vehicle started up again. And it is at that moment that Chuck Grant drives by in a truck. And Grant shouts out to Watkin, you know, do you need any help? Watkin kind of waves them off and says, we're good here. And it's at this moment that Craver raises his pistol. He shoots at Grant's truck. Grant then stops the truck. He gets out. He says, who shot at me? 
<laughs> Craver raises his hand. And it's at that moment that Grant tries to de-escalate the situation, tries to get Craver to hand his sidearm over. And it's at that time where, as we see in the series, Grant is shot through the head by Craver. Craver then pivots and he opens up on Watkin and he kills that British major as well as the German officer that he just murdered. And so in a very short amount of time, this paratrooper who's high on marijuana shoots a German officer, an American non-commissioned officer, and a British officer. He then goes fleeing into the night and Captain Spears assembles a search party to go find this guy. Roadblocks are set up, the entirety of Easy Company is mobilized. In the interim, uh, Spears, as is accurately shown in the series, uh, finds a German doctor in South Elden uh, who is able to do emergency surgery on Grant and is able to save his life. Only a few hundred yards away from the hospital is where Craver was apprehended by men of Easy Company. And uh, in the court martial records chronicling this moment, you know, the men said that this guy had like this evil red glare in his eyes. Like, he was a, an unhinged maniac. Uh, and they cornered him and they, in short, beat him up a good bit. And uh, by some miracle, though, uh, Grant is saved. Uh, he continued to have health problems connected to his injury for the rest of his life, but uh, he lived until the year 1984, and him being able to live another four decades was by and large due to the persistence of Captain Ronald Spears, who did not want to see another one of his men die heedlessly after the war came to an end. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm gonna go in there and join in. I should go in there and stuff this. I think this is one of the reasons why Floyd Talbert was a favorite of Dick Winters. Uh, you know, Winters tried not to get too attached to a lot of his uh, enlisted men and, and non-commissioned officers, uh, but this very cordial uh, brotherly relationship that he formed with Talbert. Um, I, I, I think the reasons for that are hinted at in, in scenes like this, you know, that, that this is kind of a, a gentle spirited guy who uh, likes to appeal to people's better angels. And uh, this also served as a, a point of disparity between Talbert and, and Spears. Um, Talbert never really liked Spears' style, uh, thought that he was too aggressive, perhaps sometimes a little bit egotistical. And you really get a sense of that uh, in scenes like this, where he doesn't want to partake in this violence that is being uh, inflicted on the captive. Where's the weapon? What weapon? When you talk to an officer, you say, sir. Some of these uh, lines in the dialogue are almost verbatim from uh, Stephen Ambrose's book. Uh, and indeed, it, 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 it speaks to the no-nonsense uh, mentality uh, that Spears had in, in high-pressure moments like this. Uh, according to several men, uh, this, this incident uh, it did occur, uh, largely as depicted here in the series. And, you know, after it, it happened, you know, the following day, um, a number of people uh, confronted uh, Spears about this encounter. Uh, Colonel Sink came to the headquarters and, you know, he, he questioned Spears for an hour. Sink ultimately uh, shrugged off the matter, and he, he told Spears something that he told other officers before. He said, you just should have shot the son of a bitch and saved us all the trouble. 
Not the first time Colonel Sink uh, had said that uh, throughout the war. Um, Carwood Lipton also talked to Spears about all this, and he said, you know, Spears, you know, you, you've killed men before. You've executed men before. You knew that this guy had done this. Why, why didn't you kill him? Lipton was genuinely curious. And uh, Spears confessed to him, there must have been some doubt in my mind. And then he concluded to Lipton, I never had any problem with capital punishment. And so it's this revealing moment for Spears because I think it ultimately suggests that he was tired of killing. And if there was the slightest bit of doubt in his mind, he was not going to pull the trigger as a result. Um, and so even the, the fiercest of officers could hesitate and perhaps even show a little bit of compassion or give benefit of the doubt as a result. Have the MPs take care of this piece of shit. Grant's dead? No. Grant's surgeon says he's gonna make it. Uh, something that was not shown in this pressure cooker of a moment uh, was the fact that a, a paratrooper by the name of Herman Hansen uh, barreled through the doors with a pistol in his hand and he put it right in Craver's face and, and tried to kill him in, in that moment. And Don Malarkey remembered this moment like it almost played out in slow motion. And he, he likened it to when uh, Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, you know, time almost seemed to stand still uh, in this moment where they, they almost saw this, this paratrooper bound to a chair being executed uh, right in front of them. And so it, it, was, it was one heck of a moment. Uh, you know, everybody's nerves were, were on edge. Uh, and indeed, uh, Craver was lucky to have survived that night uh, in all actuality. Uh, Craver was later court-martialed. He was found guilty. And uh, he ended up escaping uh, from prison uh, that September. And uh, he was recaptured. And uh, ultimately, he was sent to a U.S. penitentiary in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I haven't yet found out exactly uh, what happened to him, but the historical record seems to suggest uh, that he did not end up serving the life sentence uh, that was handed down to him. And uh, in all probability, he, he probably... Uh, got out of prison after a, a few years. Um, I haven't been able to fully yet uh, trace his story and find out what he did after that or, or when he died, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's interesting and it's important to put a, a name to some of these events presented in Band of Brothers, even if they are in condensed form. I'd like to resign as company first sergeant. Well, I guess you've earned your right to demote yourself. This demotion was not merely about sentimentality or, you know, Talbert missing some of his subordinates. He admitted later on that this was by and large due to the fact that he did not really get along with Spears too well. That they had very different styles of soldiering. And as Talbert later admitted to Winters, um, you know, Talbert kind of got spoiled with Winters. You know, he looked up to him as a big brother and he thought Spears to be somewhat a little bit more uh, bullish um, in regard to how he ran the company. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's important to take into account all of these different personalities, the different styles that they had. It's just like the army today. Uh, some people get along. Some people don't, and certainly Easy Company was no exception to that. It is, you know, it does not begrudge, you know, the legacy of either Spears or Talbert. They were just exceedingly different individuals. Well, sir, you make your decision yet? Yeah, I did. Spears also had uh, somewhat of a receding hairline. Uh, not like the, the thick wavy stuff that we see here, 
with actor Matthew Settle. And while I'm on the point of hair, um, everybody thinks that Dick Winters was a redhead because of this series, and that is the hair color of actor Damian Lewis. But if you look at photographs of him at the time, his hair was actually blonde. So erase that from your minds right now. Dick Winters was not a redhead. So you've decided to stay in the army? Yes, I'm gonna stay with the men. Well, I'm glad to hear it. As I mentioned earlier, but it, it bears repeating, uh, Spears did make a, a career for himself in the United States Army, and uh, he, he served another 19 years. Uh, he served not only in Korea, the Loatian Civil War, but he worked at the Pentagon during the Cuban Missile Crisis as well. Uh, so a very esteemed career indeed. Captain Sobel? Major Winters? Captain Sobel. We salute the rank, not the man. One of the best one-liners of the series. Sie alle verdienen ein langes und glückliches Leben in Frieden. I like this guy even more in Raiders of the Lost Ark when his face melts. David Webster became a writer for the Saturday Evening Post and Wall Street Journal. And later wrote a book about sharks. In 1952, uh, David Webster had a portion of his memoir published in the Saturday Evening Post, and it was fittingly entitled, We Drank Hitler's Champagne. And, you know, Webster's book is one that, that should have been published much earlier than what it was. It was only after the success of Band of Brothers, the book and the series, that this uh, memoir was once again put back in, in the spotlight. Um, but, you know, in, in the 1950s, uh, very few publishers wanted to delve into the darker complexities of GI combat. And uh, for that reason, possibly, uh, Webster's book was, was long overlooked, and uh, he did really not gain the celebrity that he deserved until many decades after his passing. How we lived our lives after the war was as varied as each man. It's the perfect way to have this montage at the end of the series. And, you know, what, what better way to have a montage, an all-American montage, than to have these paratroopers playing America's favorite pastime. It, uh, it certainly uh, uh, plucks at, at the, the heartstrings uh, a little bit, uh, but it most definitely works. This morning, President Truman received the unconditional surrender from the Japanese. War's over. On the point of VJ Day, uh, Dick Winters uh, wrote on August 11th, particularly in regard to the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He said, well, your prediction of my coming through the Pacific Wars turned out to be correct, once for a change. He's writing this to his friend Dieta Alman. It seems as though that atomic bomb carries as much punch as a regiment of paratroopers. It's almost inhuman to employ either on the human race. Lewis Nixon had some tough times after the war. He was divorced a couple of times. Then in 1956, he married a woman named Grace and everything came together for him. Uh, one thing that is not mentioned with uh, much depth here uh, is the fact that uh, Lewis Nixon married a woman by the name of Grace Umazawa. And there's a fascinating backstory behind all of this because Grace was in fact one of 110,000 Japanese Americans who was incarcerated by her own government during the Second World War uh, simply because she was of uh, Japanese descent. Um, and so, in fact, uh, Grace was in an internment camp uh, as these scenes that, that we are seeing are unfolding. And in my mind, at least I like to speculate, that the trauma that both of these individuals endured as a result of the Second World War uh, allowed them to confide in each other and that is what ultimately allowed their marriage to work in the the very uh, vigorous and romantic way that it did. Very unusual 
feeling. It's a very unusual happening and it's a very unusual bonding. And then finally, after 10 episodes, the identities of these white-haired old veterans is finally revealed to the audience. And it, it brings such closure to the series. Um, it's incredibly powerful. And at the very end, you're, you're left thankful that these guys survived so they could share these stories with us. It's so great. Grandpa said no, but I served in a company of girls. Oh, it's, it's such a perfect ending. And to end with, with Dick Winters in such a way, I think it's so important when we take into account the historical memory of Easy Company because Winters, in addition to being an excellent combat officer, uh, he was also a very articulate recorder of Easy Company history. He wrote letters, he kept files on all of his men, he, he had stacks and stacks, entire file cabinets uh, full of papers about Easy Company that he had accumulated over many, many decades. And without that historical record, the book by Stephen Ambrose and the series that we have just analyzed, it would not have been possible. Without Dick Winters and what he did in the years after the war, this book and the series, it would not exist, period. And the affection that he had for his men is represented not only in these final words that he imparts to us at the end of Band of Brothers, but in those small mountains of paperwork that was a, a true labor of love. Uh, and it was not merely about his reputation or his legacy, it was about the legacy of his men that he wanted to preserve and enshrine in some small way. And um, after this series came out, uh, you know, as I like to say, for those of you who may be fans of the movie Gettysburg, Dick Winters becomes the Joshua Chamberlain of the Second World War. There are other officers who did things just as heroic, but their stories were never made into movies or books. But because both of these men became the subjects of popular movies and books, they have become the emblematic officers of their generations. And when people often think of the Civil War, the Second World War, for a lot of people, those are the two guys that possibly come to mind. And, uh, you know, Winters, he's such a character, and I never had the chance to meet him in person, but in researching his materials and going through his letters and his correspondence, I, I feel like I, I got to know him uh, in, in a very unique way. And in one interview that, that he gave after the series came out, uh, he was asked if he had any parting words or words of advice for young people. And in addition to telling them to hang tough, he said something that was quite eloquent. And he said, you have to try your best every day. And as long as you try your best every day, that day will not have been a failure. And I think those words, as well as any, are a fitting way to wrap up our conversation on Band of Brothers. It's been uh, one heck of a ride looking at these 10 episodes. Um, I hope you've learned a lot. For those of you who already love this series, I hope that you'll love it even a little bit more after we've discussed some of the real history behind it. So, with that, we close our curtain on Band of Brothers, but we are not done with real history yet. And of course, as always, I'd like to recommend uh, some additional reading for you. Uh, one of the, the great manifestos of the 101st Airborne Division in World War II is Rendezvous with Destiny. As you can see, it is a, it is a modest tome um, of a few hundred pages. Um, but if you're really interested in the 101, uh, this is the book to look at.
On a more uh, human perspective, a more uh, organic perspective, um, is a book by airborne expert Mark Bando, which is called Avenging Eagles. And Mark Bando has interviewed hundreds and hundreds of airborne and World War II veterans uh, over the past half century. And uh, some of the, the best stories are featured in this book uh, as well as others. Um, so, not only enjoy your movies, but read up on them a, a little bit as well. That brings an end to Bander Brothers. We hope you join us next time on Real History as we continue to separate fact from fiction in historical films. We'll see you then.